Okay, so we are live on the throw show. And this is right. so Scott, this is a first so this is Coach Capos from from I was gonna say from Throws University. We're with Coach Capos from Nebraska, University of Nebraska. Yeah. And he used to coach at Iowa. When I was at school at Penn State, he was the throws coach at Iowa. He now coaches at Nebraska for seven years, I think. Yep, I just well, I just finished my sixth year, going on on seven now. Okay, and so I've sort of known Coach Capos for probably since like the mid two thousands, and I I think he's coached six hundred different All Americans, as I joked with him this past year when we presented together at uh, in Illinois. But I, I, we put out on Throws University talking about uh, sending in a whole bunch of questions for today, and it, it's a unique situation because of what's going on with the coronavirus. And a lot of these juniors and sophomores um, don't have marks, really. Even you know, maybe if they had a lackluster indoor season, a lot of people don't know who they are. And I think that bringing you on um, to the throw show, and we haven't done this in a while, but it, it's going to be interesting to, to take to see your perspective as, as somebody who's going to be recruiting a lot of these people. And, yeah, and, absolutely. You know, how is it that to prevent somebody who might be a sophomore or a junior who's who's got capability, but they don't have that season to put those marks out. You know, what are you going to do as a, as a division one, big 10 coach um, to prevent, you know, from potentially losing these, these types of athletes? Well, I think the biggest thing is I think the coaches once we're allowed to probably in July and August is to, to get on the road and seek more kids in person. So, you know, I would encourage, you know, athletes that maybe didn't have the season they wanted to and indoors or, we're outdoor only athletes to just keep training and, and videotape as much as you can. You know, I learn a lot from videotape when I watch somebody. I can usually tell um, if it's someone I think is going to be good enough or not through just watching a few throws on video. Right. And but sometimes that could hurt a kid because they might have a good performance, but you might not think they have a long term development. But that's kind of a coaching um, situation where you have to kind of judge. But I would say those kids, the biggest things they can do is just keep training videotape and, you know, have little practice meets. I'm sure there's going to be some internet meets out there in the future like there was last week right. where people are just going to have to do their own marking and, and put out performances out there um, when they can train. But um, usually I don't recommend using recruiting services or um, contacting a lot of coaches because we kind of know who the good people are. But this is a different situation. So I would say – you know, you have to reach out to coaches and send emails and videos and, and pick out your 10 or 15 favorite schools, small schools, big schools, close, far, get a mixture of different programs and start just contacting those coaches and find out what they're looking for. I, I think that's a big thing, too, is that because of social media and, and Instagram and uh, what we've got now, it's like if, if this was going on when I was in high school, so many like, – I would have fallen through the cracks as a, as a high schooler because I, I didn't have a really good career until my – the end of my junior year, early early senior year. And I think that yeah. because of social media, there's there's such a presence in the throwing community that it's like, hey, you know, somebody can message you on your Instagram handle and, and say, hey, coach, like or, – or even Nebraska Throws handle and say, hey, coach, like, can you check these out? You know, I, I threw 50 feet last year. Or I, I'm, I'm throwing 50 feet and I'm a sophomore. I, I think I can be somebody good. And now because of that, there's such a, it's such an easier reach because of social yeah. media and because of now with these internet meets. And I think that the biggest key for kids to hear is keep training. Don't stop training. Don't yeah. sit here and, you know, and, and feel sorry for yourself. Everybody, everybody in the U S is in the exact same situation as you are right now. And that's where it's, yeah. it's really strange. Yeah, I think a lot of kids are, you know, the ones that are just sitting home right now, not doing anything, are going to fall behind really fast. Right. And because kids are going to find a way, whether they're lifting logs in the forest or they're they're lifting paint cans or they're they're doing something, they're doing step ups on the, the chair in the living room. Yeah. They they've got to find a way to get better, and it might start with just some body weight work and some circuits, kind of like fall preparation again. But they've got to they've got to get some type of training in. The more specific, the better. But they've got to they've got to start working now for the future. Absolutely, one hundred percent. I think that that's that's key. Um, so I, I wanted to go into coach with some of this stuff. We got a ton of questions on throws. You and one of those questions right away is 
if, if you're a junior, what's, what's a mark that a, that a power five conference school might be looking for in, in male shot putters and male discus throwers or female shot putters and discus throwers at this time? Like you're scrolling through an internet comp and you see somebody who's a junior, you know, what, what is something that could potentially catch your eye? Um, you know, I think in the future it might be more, but I'd say right now, I think as a junior, if you're throwing, typically we look at kids that are throwing 55 plus as kind of a kid we'd want to, we'd want to investigate, you know, it all kind of starts with a paper performance. And then we try to build a relationship with an athlete and find out if it's the right situation or not. And probably 170 in the discus for guys, uh, for women, usually about 44 feet, 45 feet, um, is a little higher end female thrower, one, 140 in the discus. Those are probably marks we'd look for by the end of their junior year. Um, and when we look at progressions and a lot of the research I've done and I've looked at what other coaches have uh, done, say for women, you're lucky maybe two feet a year is like typical for the shot put and maybe eight to 10 feet in a discus is typical for guys. You know, once they start physically maturing, they can easily put on 10 feet from their sophomore to junior year or junior to senior year in the shot put and maybe 20 feet in the discus. So you're trying to project some of that out when you recruit them. Um, but it's even going to be tougher now since some of them don't have marks. So um, it, it's really hard to decide. I think coaches have to do a lot more research on on their athletes, and the and the athletes are going to have to do research to make sure they have the right coach for them. Right. Absolutely. All right. So, are you cool with diving into these questions that, that everybody? Was yeah. Saying? Yeah. I think it's great. I think those are I think those are big things we got to hit on. Is for I think for younger athletes if they're watching this like what am I going to do? Who's going to recruit me? Who's going to, who's going to contact me? And sometimes you just have to reach out to the coach. Um, I try to get back to everybody. I, I, I do a pretty good job. I'm not a hundred percent on that, but I'm pretty good at that. And I think a lot of coaches are the same way, especially now since it's, it's a totally different situation, but yeah, let's dive into some of these other questions. Okay. So I got, I have, I have a couple that I really want you to answer. And I think, I think the whole goal was basically, this can just sort of start a, a, a discussion between both of us. And I, I think that, yeah. um, you know, some of the questions right away were, um, uh, uh, if you have a spinner, they have a higher right leg right out of the back. Think about, I'm trying to think, somebody like Darlin Romani, um, mm -hmm. maybe Darrell to a point. Um, the question was basically like, what – is that bad? Is it okay? And what are our thoughts on having that high right leg right away and then it comes down more when they sweep? Or should it be different or what? What, what is your take on that? Well, the, the, the research I've read and kind of the physics and biomechanics and kind of what things like Tom Walsh does with the really high right leg, oh, yeah. it's angular momentum and they're, it's, it's rotational momentum driving forward uh, with a high right leg. But you got to keep it high. Um, I think that's important. You don't want to keep get it high and then drop it down too fast. So if you look at throwers like, say, Mason Finley and, and Krauser, they're almost kind of bow-legged at the start because they're pushing their left knee down, and their right leg's kind of going out to the side. It's not turning in. So they're already creating that separation right at the start between the two legs, and then you've got to get the right foot around the corner, and I think that's the hard part. Usually when the left foot gets to 90, you want to be getting off the right foot and getting it up and around the corner uh, in the throw to set up that position while you're still keeping your left shoulder up and not dipping it in. So I think the right leg sweep and the way people are driving it now, it may look slow when someone like Krauser does it because he's so long, yeah. but just the momentum they're creating because they've got such great levers that it really is developing a lot of speed. So I'm a big advocate of the high right leg. Um, I've seen people where they're almost up to their hip, right. and that's really high. Um, but I think you got to get it up and around first. You don't want to tuck it behind. Um, you can do that in the discus, I think, I a think, little bit. I think Romani does that where he almost, like, opens so much with his left side that his, his right, like, skyrockets super, super, super high. But I don't think that that, like, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't really teach that. I don't think it's, it's, it's not the best thing to do, you know. Yeah. And, and one of the things we were playing with this year with, with our good shot putter through almost 65 feet, I think he was really ready to throw really well. We made a little change. We were watching video of different throwers, 
And we were working on the right leg, but we also, we, what we were working on before, which is maybe my old school mentality, was like keeping the left arm kind of wrapped inside out of the back. Where now you see throwers, they kind of throw it open a little bit more. Right. As long as their chest is driving forward, I think that's the key because you got to turn that ro ro rotational momentum into, into linear speed. And the left arm maybe isn't as important as long as it's up high, not down. Because right. it's more about the chest driving forward. And that's something we kind of did with Nick Percy when he was a uh, you know, really NCAA champion and really high-level thrower for us. Um, so and I've seen like, other throwers do that. The, the, the left – like it would be like – you might actually go like, like the left knee and the hip might open up while the left arm staying staying forward. Yeah, it would stay, stay inside the knee, and that's the way I used to always teach it. And I still do that till they get to about 90 degrees, you know, out of the back. I always think, like, the back of the circle is zero, and if they're turning to the left, 90. Right. That's kind of just from teaching the hammer. That's kind of how we do it. And from there, though, they can open the left arm to the middle a little bit more as long as their chest drives forward. Right. So that's kind of a newer style, and I've just experimented with it with a couple of our throwers. Um, you know, we had another freshman. He threw 62 last year in high school, big kid. Through 58, 8 with the 16, and I thought this kid had no chance of spinning yeah, or yeah. being any good at it. And he turned out to do a great job. He really was focused, a very technical kid, and that's kind of what he did. He would open up the, open up the left arm a little bit, get the high right leg, and drive his chest forward, and it worked really well for him. So that might be kind of a newer style that's coming around, maybe a little yeah, more yeah. popular, versus, you know, I used to keep the left arm in, and but my guys kept – dropping short like they would they wouldn't get to the middle of the circle they would always land to the right side of the circle and so we we tried this and it was really starting to work well so just a maybe a different way to combine the higher right leg and and think more chest to the middle uh rather than just trying to hold the left side as you spring forward right right okay okay i think that leads into the next question and this is i i can't wait to hear this because i think this is my the the thing that i coach the worst or or that i struggle with the most is having you know right-handed throwers getting off that left getting off the left effectively and getting the left down quickly what yeah is, you know what is a drill or what is a cue or what is what is your you know principle behind that that fast having a faster left leg to the front well i, I think there's kind of two schools of thought we had a, a kind of a family of really good throwers that have been at Nebraska, the Myers, like Alex Meyer was here. She was very successful. Her sister was the best high school thrower in the nation last year. As a junior, she's coming here to play volleyball and hopefully throw. And her dad was a 200-foot discus thrower here. And what they really all work on is their left leg actually straightens and they drive up to the middle. And for them and certain throwers, that works great. They really extend and drive forward into the throw. Um, a lot of the times I'll teach just drop, trying to drop the left knee and keep it flexed as you push forward. Right. I think for the more compact thrower, that's probably more effective. Um, but it's something we play with. It's kind of, it's really a unique thing. You have to watch each thrower and see maybe what they can do well. But if they get too high, then there's a lot of ground force coming back down. So they've got to be strong enough to be able to hit and turn into the middle. Yeah. So if they can't do that, they definitely have to keep the left knee bent as they drive forward. Because I had some young younger girls when I was first started coaching, and they looked beautiful, and they would drive up to the middle, but they would land, and they'd get stuck. It'd be like a plop they, almost. Yeah, and they couldn't turn out of it. So with I've kind of learned over the years. Well, let's keep those doors maybe a little bit lower, yeah. and they can they they can turn through it a lot better uh, because it's it's not as much ground force. Uh, and they can't and they can't turn out of it if, if they get too high. So I think you have to play with it. But I would say most throwers, it's probably keeping the left knee down and try to push forward. Uh, once if you video from the side, once your right leg starts to pass the left side, Come on. then you want to try to push off. Yeah. yeah. So you got to think like one step ahead. Yeah. So you don't want to wait to push off. But, you know, if you're a taller thrower with some good strength levels, you can. I think you can drive up and be a little more effective if I had to pick. It depends on the thrower, though. Like, Percy, like, he stayed pretty low. But yeah, Alex was a 185-foot discus thrower. She had some injuries, and, you know, she's still training. She went really up, and she was able to react well out of that. So it really depends on 
what style fits your coaching methods and each individual athlete. Yeah, I think that's 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 good. And, and one of the things, Nick Arrhenius, he's got like one of the fastest left legs. And when like we always will say, when the right grounds in the middle, ideally the left leg will be pass the left foot will be passing the right when the right grounds. That's like a yeah. like a sign of a fast a fast left. And with Sam, it's funny because Sam has a lower left leg, and when his right is wider out of the back, he gets off of his left faster because he's not falling in as much. And I yeah. asked this with both of them, with Nick especially, like, how is your left so quick? And he said he's never really thought about it. Like, he, he it's just something that he's, he's naturally had. And I think that that's – it's like one of those things where I try to say, like, push from your foot, but I would, I would teach against – that extension because I'd be concerned that they, maybe they'd take up too much circle space and maybe yeah. I'm wrong, you know, and I think that it's like, it's like plantar flexing from the left foot without, without doing much else. And I think that that's why it's such a hard principle to, to get people to have that, that fast left. And it, it all, it also probably just comes back to like, dude, if you have more reps in the throw, it's probably going to get quicker, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think the, I think that keeping it lower is, is better for probably the majority of the throwers. But also, when size. you're keeping the left leg low, you know, you want to keep the right side high, and you got to point the toe up. Yeah. You know, I've been teaching my son how to spin. He's a glider right now. He's 15. He's just really first year throwing more than just for a month. And, you know, he's switching to the spin, and he's actually starting to get – some of these motions really well but he does drop the toe as he comes to the middle if you can keep the right toe up yeah you know that would be really good that was, that was I, one of our questions today was yeah because i remember years ago i went to see uh, a clinic with mike maynard who's you know he's a ucla he coached a lot of great people and he's talking about dorsiflex in the foot and i'm like what the hell is he talking about that yeah, sounds yeah. so goofy you know and years later i'm like you know that's that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was like, wow, that I get it. So a lot of people will say, why why should we dorsiflex? And I think that, you know, if you look at, I, I will just use Krauser or or even even Walsh is like when the when the right knee is up and that the foot is dorsiflex, one like you get a little more. It's it's a longer it's a longer path for the leg to sweep in. So you're going to get a little yeah. more energy rotationally and, and your groin gets hit up and then it's like long. And then when that cuts in and it, and it flexes when it grounds, it just creates like a very rapid reaction but that I think transfers well to that left side moving to the front as well. And I'll even coach like, look, if you're – as far as your right leg goes out when you dorsiflex, that's where – to a point, I want your left leg to think the same way as like as though your left leg's sweeping to the front too. As long as yeah. you're holding that the upper body position, and I think yeah. that's where it's. I mean, it gets a little more advanced there, but it's. We had the question today: Why should we dorsiflex? And I think that you know, I think there's a couple different reasons behind it, but I think that having that longer right leg and and creating that more energy to the center, really is why you want to lead with with the dorsiflex foot than with a knee. Yeah, and one of the things that kind of goes back to, like, I, I've been slowly writing a book about coaching track and field and kind of the art and science, and there's a lot of science behind it. But when you look at runners, they dorsiflex because they're, pre they're preparing for ground forces. They're preparing for the impact into the ground and reacting. Yeah. And the, the faster runners have a much more rigid ankle and, and toe when they plant. Yeah. And I think it's the same thing in the throws. You kind of dorsiflex. It's a lot more rigid. And you're going to be able to react better using kind of the stretch shortening cycle and say, eccentric contractions. Yeah, it's it's a it's a length in Achilles here, and yeah. then as it comes back in, it's a it's a stretch shortening cycle essentially when that right grounds. And then that's if you watched, it's funny because yeah, you know, I'm I'm trying to get Taman when his right grounds, he sort of stops his knee stops his right knee stops turning and his right foot stops turning. And I said, dude, watch yeah. Krauser and Kovacs when they're and Durrell, when their left foot hits, their heel is like 15 degrees ahead of where your heel is because, and I think it's because of the way they're sweeping with that right, it creates it and it keeps rotating while that, that while that left side's moving to the front. Yeah. So, all right. So that sort yeah. of that, yeah. takes, that, that takes care of that question. So I think one other thing, like with with spinners, like I'll talk to the athletes about, like we talk about again mainly because I 
more of the hammer or something throw the hammer. Like when they plant, other than Nick Percy, I've never had an athlete that can turn their right foot from when they plant, say, at 270 degrees and, and turn it to 90. Yeah. So if you can only turn it 70 degrees, you want that right foot, for the most part, to be at 90 degrees or, you know, basically across the midline, right. uh, parallel to the center of the throw, you know, the center of the – across the midline of the throw. So – you'd have to pre-turn that right foot because you're not going to be able to turn it 180 degrees. So you got to pre-turn it and keep it turning once it moves. So okay. you got to figure out, like, you're probably – it's hard to change how much they can turn their foot. Yeah. So that's, that takes a lot of work. But if you pre-turn it and they can only turn it 70 or 80 degrees or 60 degrees, then you know, okay, I need to plant back at, say, if you use a clock, like at 1 o'clock oh, or 2 o'clock. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and if they can't, then – if they can turn it, that's great. But if they can't, they can. They got to get it back to ninety degrees by the time the left foot gets down. Right. Okay. Perfect practice. Give me what. What would be Coach Capos's perfect practice at Nebraska? Lay out. You know, in a minute, can you describe what your ideal practice is where you don't want to choke slam your throwers? <laughs> well. Um, yeah, I've got a little bit of a reputation maybe with some of my athletes where I do get a little upset at times, and I'm working on my emotional control. Uh, I've been – this can relate to me. me. <laughs> no, I get pretty – you know, and I'm trying – it's because I care. And yeah, yeah, I yeah, see yeah. Them exactly. Succeed. And it's not because I'm mad at them. I just – I'm more like I wish they would have succeeded because they worked so hard to be successful. <laughs> yeah. um, so – uh, you know, if I had more time and less athletes, I'd probably spend a lot more time each practice talking about goals. What are we working on today? Yeah. How are we going to get there? Then review, maybe give them a little bit of homework. But And that's hard to do because I coach over 20 athletes. You coach a lot of people. Right. So I think they have to come in very focused on what they want to do and what they want to accomplish. But I think it's a good idea for a coach to ask, what do you want to work on today? Because you might have a totally different idea. Yeah, but so you want to ask them maybe what do you want to do today? What are you what are you trying to accomplish? And I'd say like if I had an ideal throwing session, let's say they're taking twenty to twenty four throws in an event. Um, maybe their first five or six throws or what I, what I would call like technique 85 percent. Then they're going to maybe hit five or six throws pretty hard, and we would try to record those. And then we take maybe seven or eight throws where it's back to about 85 percent, and it's more, a little more technical. And then sometimes at the very end of the session, if, if things are going well and what we've kind of focused on is working, I might throw something else at them at the end of the session. So, okay, well, your right foot's been turning really well. That's really good. Uh, these last couple of throws, let's just see if we can get your left arm to do whatever we want it to right, do. Yeah, yeah. Go up or, so we kind of focus on maybe one cue and that might take weeks. It might take a couple of throws. Every athlete's different, but sometimes at the end of the session, I'll throw something different. So, Adam, but I would say uh, if you think like a third, a third, a third of your throws is like kind of warm up, get technique, yep. hit some throws, and then finish up with okay, working on the technique a little bit more because you got to prepare them for competition. They're going to have to throw under stress, yeah. and I think the more you can measure in practice, and that's kind of all the part of the bonder chuck thing, which we we've, we've tried to do, but we're we're getting better at it is to measure every day. But there's so many variables when you have younger throwers that the, the, the distances are very different versus the more seasoned thrower. But I think just the idea of, okay, I need to throw some hard ones. Where am I at today? What was my best today? Don't be obsessed by it, but at least have an idea of this is where I'm at after I squatted really heavy. Right. Well, that's what, so that would take me. Okay. So if, if, if you have a perfect practice, would it be those that throw set up and then what's next? Do they just go to the weight room or do they do something else? Or what do you see in the weight room that you want to get out of your guys? Or women. Well, I, I think it depends on the day. So I think when we you talk about like periodization of training, if we're throwing uh, standard, maybe two thirds of our throws with the standard, maybe a third with the light, uh, that might be more an Olympic lifting day, some plyometric training, some med ball, explosive med ball. Um, but if they're doing a heavier shot and some standard shot, that would be more like their strength day where they're doing bench and squats and, and those sort of things. And I, I'd like to see them sometimes even end the session where I'll, I'll put it in their workouts where I want them to do, maybe they're going to do 15 or 20 drills um, in the weight room yeah. on the platform. 
or they'll throw some med ball uh, for event specific work in the weight room at the end of the session. So I think the more reps they can do with the actual technique and the more reps they can do with even an easy release is better than just doing a drill. So the more they can get that work in, the better, better off they're going to be uh, down the road. Right. For sure. Okay. So we got a question on somebody wants to get hyped for a meet, but they also don't want to get meat jitters. So they want to get, they have problems having these meat jitters, but they also want to bring the wood when they're competing. What would you, you know, what do you recommend in that, that situation? Well, I think it kind of goes back to what we just talked about competition rehearsal. Yeah. So the more you can rehearse that in training, I'm going to steal that, steal that one. <laughs> All right. What's, what, what, what word, what word do you like there? The competition, competition rehearsal. rehearsal? I'll, yeah, I'll cite yeah. you though. I'll cite you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got that part in my book. I'm writing eventually here too, when I get it done sometime <laughs> in 2020, got a little more time now than I thought, but yeah, yeah I think the more you can do that, the better. And, one of the things, even back, I, I was fortunate to have a great high school coach, and we would actually do that. He called it breakneck speed. Yeah, and yeah, we yeah. would do it with a 10-pound shot. So we would throw, like we talked about, like the third of the session, we'd do it with a light shot. And I just throw, try to throw the piss out of it six yeah, yeah. times. Yeah. And then we go back, okay, let's do a few technical throws with whatever shot, standard, light and kind of go back to the technique. What went right? What went wrong? What do we got to work on? So I, I think – that's, that's kind of the mindset. And you got to prepare yourself. You got to have rituals that are kind of based on logic. Yeah. You know, going to Wendy's and eating a cheeseburger and fries and a, and, a, and a shake because that worked for you when you threw your PR is not a reason to do that before every, every meet. You know, they got to be logical. And so, you know, you got you to gotta compete like you practice. So, you know, don't fall in practice. Stay in the ring. Yeah. I don't know how many times I have to tell my athletes that, you know, stay in the ring. That, that's simple. I'd say this too. Dr. B would never care. Like if, if you're a spinner, like you, you do a little rotation and your left yeah. foot lands out. As soon as you start getting further out, like, okay, you do a reverse, your left foot lands out. He would say, okay, you could save that in a meet. You start blasting and your left foot's falling out and then your right side's coming out. He's like, yeah. no, save throw, save throw. You know? And, and that's the thing yeah. is we get, really good at having technique where we're blasting out of the front and then you're you're going into a competition you're like oh my gosh am i going to save am i going to be able to save this so then you don't have that confidence to really focus on putting it into the throw because you're too concerned about saving your throw yep and back to that like when i and i won't name names but you know i see a lot of athletes train we go to the big 10 go to the ncaa and i see some that they follow every throw and and they got great performances but you know, I've seen about half those guys that came in maybe ranked first in the in the nation that follow their throws a lot. They 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 don't, they may or may not get it done. Right. right. And I, I've seen multiple times where they didn't get it done because they're a little reckless in practice. And it's okay to be aggressive and go for it. Hey, you got it. Sometimes that's that's great, but you also have to know like that is that savable? Right. Come on, name names. <laughs> uh, I won't do that, but uh, you know. I see a lot of Big Ten throwers, and I see a lot of you know the guys at the national meets uh, doing doing that, and and some are very successful, but some of them I've seen fall out of major championships. Yeah. This one, uh, Hetzendor from from Wichita sent us a question. Oh man, he said ninety four the ninety four football season. Who is better, Penn State or Nebraska? The, he was the real <laughs> number one. <laughs> well. John's one of probably the best javelin coaches in the country. He's an awesome coach. Very, respect him very much. Great guy. Um, you know, I I don't know. I was I was teaching high school or something back then. I wasn't even paying attention to college football. So I, I, it's be I, I guess Penn State. Penn State. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> okay, so this is another good one. I like this a lot. Real blanket statement. Uh, and – some of these questions are always a little ridiculous, but it's like, okay, I want to throw 60 meters in the discus. Sure. Uh, or, or as a female, probably something similar to a, to a woman would, uh, would probably be like 55 to 6, probably 60 meters. Yeah. Um, what would you say would be benchmark lifts? Because I know you also have a decent amount of, of you know, we had a, also awesome. have a question on benchmark lifts too. And I, so I, I wanted to use this sure. in the shop, but mainly let's start with, um, 
discus, 60 meters, men, 60 meters, women. What do you, what would you tell somebody okay. to do? So the first thing I would say is, you know, where are you at now and what do you got to do to get there? So um, if you're a 60 meter thrower, you, you probably need to throw at least 57 meters in practice on a consistent basis. Okay. I would start with the most specific things first. You know, and if you've got different weight discuses, you know, are you throwing, if you're throwing the 175, are you throwing that 62 meters? You know, and with the women, are you throwing the 0.8, 61, 62 meters in practice, maybe a little bit further. So I'd start with the most specific things first. Yep. Um, and then go, go from there because, and it depends on the body type of the athlete. The, the guys, I think there's a little more consistency. The power clean probably has the highest correlation with most of the throwing events. So if you want to throw 60 meters, you probably got a power clean 350. You want to throw 60 feet, you probably got a power clean at least 350. Um, you know, probably back squat for guys, 550, 500 to 550. Um, for the women, I always think like if you can, if you could squat like 400 to 450, you're probably pretty strong. Um, and then your, your Olympic lifts probably got to be, you know, probably 20, 30 pounds over your body weight, maybe a little bit more. Um, so I think some of it's kind of body weight relation too, um, for your, for your strength levels. I'd say too, I, I will chime in that. I think that if, if you're looking at the women's discus, the women's discus, a, a female discus thrower does not need to be as strong in my opinion, as a male relative to the male discus thrower. Cause I think yeah. the, the women's, the women's discus, a lot of those, a, a lot of the, it's almost a different event where it's like, if you're super mobile in your shoulder and as soon as that left leg lands, if you can, can if that's where I think the strength comes into play is that if you yeah. can hold that big stretch and then stay mm -hmm. grounded, like, like think about Perkovich and you just sling the shit out of it. Like it's, it's almost like, for women's discus, shoulder mobility is almost more in tune than like than necessarily what your power cleaning or or, or what your what your yeah. Clean, you know. I mean, you still have to. Most of these women are still able to power clean probably a hundred plus kilos and and bench press. Sure. You know, uh, or full clean. You know, one hundred twenty maybe. Like, like I know Maggie Ewan can do that, and and it's like now you start to factor in if, if they can bench or if they can squat four hundred plus. You know can they bench press anywhere between 250, 300 pounds? They're probably going to be fine if they're a discus thrower. Yeah, yeah. And I think the with the discus, it is a little different event for the women because it is, it, it's pretty light yeah, compared yeah. to, you know, body weight ratios and all those things. So it's a lot more of a speed event. So if you look at, like, speed of release, men's javelin, then women's javelin, then women's discus is probably – the highest release velocities out of all the throws. Yeah. So you've got to train in relation to release velocity because that's the most important factor to throw far. So you've got to train if you're if you just got a women's discus thrower, she has to train maybe a little bit more like a javelin thrower than someone who's maybe, you know, does both. So yeah. you gotta kind of tailor the training toward what what qualities do they need to throw far and with women's discus being so light, yeah. And, and guys, you know, they just there needs to be a certain strength level to, to reach those performances and there's a certain level of strength to just perform the technique adequately too. Yep. I think for a while, especially once Dr. B stuff started to get like popular for a while, everybody was like, Oh, you don't need to be that strong. You don't need to be that strong. But I think everybody's sort of realizing like, dude, you need to be strong to throw far. You want to throw 22 yeah. meters or, or 20 meters. You've got to be strong. Like you've got to, you, you have to be strong to, to hold those positions. I guess, that sort of takes me into what would you say, you know, you got a female wants to throw 1750 to 1850 or a male who wants to throw 21, you know, what is, what, what would you put as, as those numbers? Or maybe 20 is a, a better number. I, I think kind of the, the, probably like a 20 mid 20 guy, probably have to at least probably a 425 to 450 bench, um, probably near 400 pounds in the power clean and 600 pounds in the squat. And then for women, um, you know, the one girl I had that was close to some of those marks, she was a little bigger girl. She could, she could bench probably 275, and she can 
clean, probably 250. Uh, she had some back issues, so her squat wasn't quite as good. But I, I bet if we tested it, she'd probably do 450 pretty easily. Okay. Um, so I, I think when you start to get in those little higher levels for the women, um, for shot put especially, I think they got to be pretty strong. Yeah. You know, and you've, what do you think? You've had some experience with some women with Rachel and some of these other girls. Well, Rachel, Mo, I mean, Moe's back squatted close to 500 pounds. Um, dude, she's front squatted like 175 kilos. Uh, dude. Yeah, Rachel back squatted over 450. Um, well, no, her back squat was like 190. So like, uh, 420, yeah, 423, something like that. But, but over 400, good, yeah. good depth. And, you know, she's benched 315. Um, Moe's bench was at, like, 260. Not as high, but Rachel's Rachel's bench was good. And then Rachel's uh, power clean, 115. Um, Mo has, Mo's got a problem with her cleans, but she's snatched over 90, over 95 kilos. So it's, you know, if you, if you do the weightlifting conversion to clean, it's around 120 um yeah the 265 so i think where you're saying is, is if you're a female and you want to you want to throw 18 meters i think ideally you would bench close to 300 pounds you would you would clean 250 plus pounds and you'd squat over 400 i think that the yeah those are, those are good numbers and i think athletes have to understand too like when you look at like the path to be an olympian or one of these world-class throwers you're probably looking at 27 to 28 years old yeah yeah so yeah, yeah. you've got five years after college where you need to find a way to keep training to keep grinding 100 and keep grinding and your strength levels go up i think for like a high school athlete if you're a high school guy if you can bench 350 yeah. you can squat 450 to 500 you can power clean 275 you're yeah. strong yeah, yeah yeah and for a girl again it's it's kind of based on body weight if you can if you can come close to cleaning your body weight or back squatting, maybe 1.25 times your body weight, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, so, and that, and strength really develops over time, just, just like throws. And you got to look at kind of the long-term process to get strong. You don't have to be that strong, but you've got to have something <laughs> that's going to make you throw far. And yes. whether it's technique, strength, or speed. And I've talked about this in other forums where, you probably need two out of those if you're going to be good. If you're going to be world class, you need all three. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the, and the thing that people forget is that, dude, the stronger you get, the the better your technical positions will be, and the because you can hold those technical positions, your speed will increase. Like that, they all they're they're it's it they all factor in together. Like that's where yeah. I think people people forget that. Um. Yeah lift before or after throws I, I always lift after i mean I, I think this this was just a random question somebody had said um is it better to lift before or after throwing and i think it, it's it's you've always got to lift after you throw but if you're in the situation where you can't do that you have to lift before you throw your mm -hmm. body will adapt to it. it's not ideal but your body will get used to that and you'll be able to still put out solid results yeah, I think if you do one lift before, if you do something like your explosive lift before you throw, that would be okay. Yeah. Uh, if you're, if you're going to go too heavy on a squat or a bench, it's going to be somewhat detrimental. And there's scientific studies about potentiation. And, you know, there's some big studies with sprinters and doing like 75% squats for like five sets of two, a half hour before they ran. And they ran really fast. And, you know, when I had two guys in the Big Ten, similar to your area, Shane and John, yeah. We brought weights to Wisconsin, and we did power cleans an hour before the Big Ten meet, and they went one, two. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, it, it depends on the athlete. Like, we experimented with that before we did it. Um, we just didn't say, hey, we're going to try this. Um, so I think you can do some lifting before, but not a lot. You know, if you want to get one lift in, you're crunched for time. And, you know, if you're going to – and if you're going to divide up your training – you, you deal with this a little more than I do. If you're going to do double sessions, you probably want about four hours yeah. if you can bet between those two sessions. Uh, do you guys do much of that? That's kind of one of my we, questions, I guess, for you. We, we always will say 10 and 3. We, we, Dr. Okay. B, Dr. B used to like at least six hours because we would do 9 and 3. So okay. I, I, I think what you're saying, though, is right, four, four plus hours. So anything that you can go like home and relax or nap or, or you know, just chill out I think is, is good. I mean, I've, yeah. I've been in um, – we had a, like a little mini camp here before all this shit went down where Alex came out and he came out on a Sunday and we got 12 sessions in 
dude, we got 12 sessions in, in uh, three and a half years. We were doing like triples every, every single day. And so wow. we, we were going, <laughs> wake up, show up, um, mobility and drills. Then they would hang out. We would watch uh, technique stuff on the, in our, we had put a big screen in the front room. Um, and then after we would, we would do that. Then we would go throw for the morning. Then we would lift. Then we would take lunch. They'd go home and nap. And then they'd come back. And then in the afternoon, we were going, we were going hard. Uh, that's, oh, nice. that's, that's pretty difficult, though. Um, yeah, well, we did this year. We, we experimented with, with some of our throwers doing two a day. And mostly the morning sessions were like drills and yeah. easy throws, maybe in their second event. And then we would do like their main event in the afternoon. And right. um, we were actually making some really good progress with, with, with some of the younger throwers doing that before we had to kind of shut everything down. And, um, it, was, it was working really well. It's something I'm going to implement in the future where we, we do some morning stuff with a lot of our athletes just I to think- kind of prepare them for the afternoon. I think I think it does a couple of different things. One, you get a ton of throws in, so you're you're yep. you're getting more volume. But two, you learn how to handle stress of like uh, like throwers are they they struggle so much with not you know not throwing far. But if you're training in the morning, you're like, dude, screw it, I'm just getting technique work done. Yep. And you you learn you mature so much quicker, and it, and it and it's sort of like it. it it, it's like exponential then it's like oh wow well if i'm not throwing that far it's not it's not a horrible thing it's okay i'm gonna survive this and and i think yeah. it, you become more logical when you start to train twice a day because you you're more in tune with your body so i wanted to say so before we go into uh, the the last thing i have here um there's a question on technical models, the technical keys to discus and then a comparison of ba- barnes and krauser but before we do that I thought that could be like a, a good technical roundup. Um, sure. Somebody had asked about Dylan on, on the on the AMA for me that oh, for throws you. They were like, you know, Dylan was a freak. Yeah, what was he good at? And I said, dude, the kid the, he power cleaned uh, 200 kilos for four. Um, he benched 500 pounds like breakneck speed. Um, mm-hmm he could power snatch 140 like without ever really snatching just like boom like the worst technique ever like he was just a freak of nature he could dunk a 35 pound medicine ball um and he was 330 pounds and and i guess my question was i know i'm you know just sort of catering to instagram here but but i wanted to ask you were you ever around a freak of nature of that that magnitude where you're like dude this this person I actually think Sam Sam's similar to this, where it's like some days Sam does stuff, and I'm like, dude, that's fucked up. Like, how the hell do yeah. you do that? You know? Yeah. Well, I think yeah, there's some of those athletes. Like, I think with Dylan, I think no matter what technical model he was using, he's gonna throw far. <laughs> yeah. It didn't matter. And it was kind of like back in the days when like Matt Wilkins was, you know, he talked about the glory days, and like he said, I was gonna throw far no matter what I did because I was so strong and dialed in. It didn't matter. Right. Like I can screw up and still throw two thirty. Right. You know, and I think Dylan was probably similar to that. He's gonna throw over twenty one meters. No matter what. Just because he's got so many other qualities that are gonna help him throw far. Um, yeah, you know, I think we see that sometimes in certain athletes where they have, but it's it's kind of like the once in a lifetime athletes, maybe for a high school coach and for college, maybe you get a couple of those because you can kind of pick and choose a little bit more, but probably the biggest athlete I had like that was probably a guy named Jeremy Allen I had at Iowa oh that I forgot about him he um so we never did overhead shot throws you know in training once in a while so he goes to Big Ten indoor me yeah we we don't do this he's so he steps in and starts doing overhead throws and threw like 75 feet you're like what I'm like what and we don't even like work on him (laughs) and 75 feet I'm not kidding you and I remember hearing this oh my god and so, yeah, he, he, his Piero is like 17, 20. He's so like 56, 8. He goes in and throws like 59 feet, yeah. you know, in the meet, you know. And then he threw like 190-something in the discus as a freshman, yeah. you know. And then he went on to play football, and he had success. He was fourth in the NCAA. And he did, then he played in the NFL a little bit. So he had a great career. But, yeah, he was one of those that's, a, that's kind of the, the freak of nature. Um, you know, but guy like Nick Percy, he worked his butt off. Nick's talented, but – he worked for everything he got, you know, and there's some athletes that maybe don't do that because they are blessed, but you know, 
it eventually kind of catches up with you. So we don't, I don't see that too often. Um, I try to find those people and, you know, try to kind of find the diamonds in the rough. And that's why you go to some more of these high school meets, like we were talking about in the beginning with recruiting, the more a coach can get out and see people, the more you might find that person that's going to be that, that freak show yeah. down the road because they're doing things because their technique stinks or whatever. I, um, I did want to say this earlier, is that even from a recruiting perspective for you, it's like I, – I, I know this is backtrack a little, but, but you see a kid, maybe he is a freak, and he, but he's only throwing 50 feet online or something – and, and he's doing it right now. Not only do you see it like, oh, that's that kid. Like, that kid's a stud. But he's also training in a very a, – in a very precarious situation. Like, he's not he's, – yeah. he's putting out that – and this brings in, like, somebody like Percy. And, dude, Sam, Sam's physically very, very talented. But he can grind – like, every day he's lifting, throwing, focusing on technique. He's very, very – he works his ass off on all aspects. And I think that that's something that you see a high school kid and they're training right now during the, the, the quarantines and they're, they're mm-hmm. figuring it out they're in their basement doing clap pushups and they're doing drills. And from a coaching perspective, that's where you got to be like, dude, this kid wants it. He wants, he, you know, he or she wants to be a champion. And that's yeah. the person in my mind that you would want more so than the freak of nature because they're going to be easier to coach. Yeah, I think, you know, there, there are some, I think some athletes maybe have a hard time understanding this and maybe it's not the greatest thing to say for potential recruits, but you know, there are some, there are some genetic limitations with certain athletes, but I think our goal as a coach is to maximize their genetic potential. And if they are a freak, if we can get them to that level, maybe they're going to be an Olympian. But if they're not, if we can get them to score in the big 10 meet for me or to you know, go on to the NCAA first round. To me, that's a huge coaching accomplishment. I'm very proud of athletes that do that because they've really maximized every bit of talent they had. You know, I've had athletes that they scored in the big 10 meet their fifth year. They finally scored. Right. That was a huge accomplishment. Yep. You know, and I was just excited for them as I was when Nick Percy won the NCAA. That's satisfaction in coaching. Yeah. 100%. Before we go into the technique, Lucas McKay, coach at Penn State, asks, Scott, what are your what are your thoughts on the transfer portal? Um, so I don't want to discourage coaches from that, but I think, in my opinion, I could be wrong because I I'm going to recruit some of those kids and some of the and I've got kids that are leaving here um, sometimes because I might not be the right coach for them and it's just not the right atmosphere. Um, what, what I've seen in maybe other sports is kids think that the grass is greener. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then, like, especially in, like, football and basketball, then they don't get offers. Yeah. And they're sitting there, and they don't have a scholarship anymore. Right. And, and track's different because we have a lot of partials. Um, but I would just warn kids, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. Um, every coach is going to have faults. And, you know, it's, it's a difficult situation. You try to build those relationships with athletes and so that doesn't happen but it does happen sometimes and you work hard to try not to have that happen. But I think with the transfer portal, I think you just got to be careful if you're an athlete, because I think you got to really evaluate your situation and is it fixable? You know, is it something that if it's broken, it's something's broken, but it is, can you repair that? Whether it's whatever it is, athletic medicine, strength training, coaching, um, so I would just be a little worried about kids that are going in that situation thinking, oh, this is going to be so much better for me. Right. Because right. Coach Capos doesn't know what he's saying or whatever. Uh, and I've had that he happen. Told me you know, a bad often, thing. But once in a while, hey, you know, kids, everyone's, you know, everyone's, I'm not the ideal coach for everybody. You know, I've got certain, you know, dysfunctions maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I try to do a good job. I, I've been successful for 30 years as a coach. But, you know, I've had some people that, you know, may, a very few that maybe walk away and like, man, that wasn't the right guy for me. So I, I think you got to do your homework if you're going to transfer. And I think coaches have to do their homework because I, I think there's something's not right, whether it's the coach or the athlete. And I think the, you got to do your homework if you're recruiting those kids or if you're one of those kids, make sure you, you find the best situation for yourself. Mm-hmm. For sure. All right, so if we would go – let's give me – how about – let's go keys to the discus, 
compare Barnes and Krauser, then we'll do a little roundup with like technical models, and then we'll be we'll we'll call. Is that all right? Could you hear me? All, all right, that sounds good. Right. So uh, discus, you know, discus is a little bit different, I think, than the rotational shot because mentioned earlier, like I think your right foot you can tuck it behind you a little bit in the discus and then get it around. And I think there's some things you can do because it's it's a little bit lighter, especially for women that you can get away with. But I think when, when I coach the discus, the biggest thing we try to do is get separation right from the start, keep the discus behind the hip, uh, be very linear on your sprint, keep everything turning, and really try to drive the discus out in front of you. What do you um, mean when, when you would – so describe linear – Describe what you would mean by that linear. Uh, so I think the first movement out of the back is rotational. Right. So when your left foot gets to 90 degrees, you yeah. got to pick up your right foot, and I say get it around the corner. Yeah. you got to get the right foot out in front of the left foot. So if you're filming from behind, your right foot should be clear past your left foot. Yeah. And once you get there, then it's a linear motion. It's, it's sprinting forward. It's driving forward. Um, you don't want it's, – it's a spin, but it's really more of a linear action. So it's – it's like a backward seven almost. I think John Paul used to say that. So, so I, I think we got a sprint. Cut, cut the right in. The left, the left would be like your knees would come closer and over top yes. with the left, not as much wide with the left. Yeah, I think you know even back when I used to listen, I used to go to the NCAA meet when I was a younger coach. I just sit there for hours and just watch people like Art Fenegas coach. Yeah. You know. I just sit in the stands or sit on the bench and just watch them. And that's one of the keys um, Art used to use was squeeze the knees and face the throw. And, you know, I used to just listen to those guys coach because I knew I was a rookie and I needed to learn. And I would just hang out and watch those guys. And so I think, yeah, it's about just kind of get around the corner with the, hopefully a higher right foot. I've seen people throw with a lower foot but and just drive, keep everything moving forward because I think it gets too rotational. And then the discus is much more of a, I think it's a long slinging action versus where the shot puts more of a lift and turn. Okay. So I think if you keep the discus behind, get the right foot out, sprint forward, long pull on the finish. Just, and you can't teach all that at once, but right. I think you got to, when you go to technique correct, you just got to kind of fix the back part and work your way to the front of the ring. Right. Um, but, you know, everyone throws a little bit different in my group, but, they, they do some things that are really good, and some do some, some things that need some work, but uh, we kind of look at common elements. So I don't know if we have a technical model per se. We kind of say, okay, this throw, this throw, and this throw, all do this really well. So that's probably something that needs to be done if you're going to throw far. I, I think that's, that's like – I think what you just said is like, okay, well, shot. Let's just say Joe sweeps his right leg really well. He holds his left really well. Krauser, you know, just to bring something up, uh, or Walsh smashes his finish really well, and you can almost take maybe an aspect from, you know, all three of those those top dogs, and now all of a sudden you're saying, like, hey, Joe does this well in the middle, but Krauser does this out of the back. Walsh does this at the finish. Terrell does this on his finish. Well, let's try and piece this together to fit to fit what you're doing. Yeah, because every athlete's going to have certain things they can do really well, and there's some of those elements they, they're not going to be able to do. Maybe it's a physical limitation or whatever it is. They can't do that, or their their habit's so ingrained they can't change that. Right. So you got to look for the things they can do and, and keep working on those things. And, yeah, everyone's going to be a little bit different. It's taken Joe Koufax a long time to get where he is. You know, I remember his senior year, he finally broke – I don't know if he threw over 19 – 50 before his senior year maybe just over 19 maybe as a junior mm -hmm. you know and he started throwing over 20 meters and just kept working at it working at it technique kept getting better and better and I think Tom Walsh was kind of the same way and made some changes and and does and now is doing those guys are all doing amazing things Krauser started off on a little higher trajectory throwing 77 feet in high school um but you know he's really refined his technique a lot more but he's long and slow where some of these guys they're shorter, so they got to find a way to get that momentum going, and they have to be faster. So you got to find kind of what works for you, but pick apart those athletes and see what they all do well in each phase of their throw. I think that 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 goes back to too what you were saying with the with the uh, with the sixty meter stuff. It's like people don't realize like 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 
dude, Sam and I and, and Alex, like, we're at this point where it's like, all right, Alex threw 65 uh, plus indoors twice, but he was throwing like 63 to 64 in training. So if we could get him outside, he could probably throw 66 to 67 plus. But you yeah. gotta have those training throws up there, and and that's where yeah. like with Sam, even it's like 63 to 64 in training is good, but you've got to do it like four to five times with good movement, and that's the thing with you know what you brought up with Joe is like. Joe, you know, to get to throw twenty two ninety one, which is an absurd throw, he's probably has he probably knew like I've got to throw twenty one fifty to twenty two in training to be able to to bring yeah. out that dream throw, you know. And I, I think that's what a lot of throwers don't really recognize is that you've got to not just have a level to get to, but then you've got to be consistent at that level to be a you know to 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 sort of take that next step up that up that ladder. Yeah, we and I talk a lot about that with the throwers that I've coached. Like, okay, if you throw, let's say you, you, you've thrown 58 feet. Okay, you throw 60, big jump. Okay, now you got to kind of fill in the gaps. you got to have a bunch of 58 and 59s. Then you'll probably throw 62 or 63. Then you got to have a bunch of 61s and 62s. And, yeah. you know, the guy I've got now, Berger, he threw 62 feet as a freshman here, which was amazing. He had one throw over 59 feet all year. Right, right. The next year. He had 10 throws over 60 feet, and he threw 63. This year he threw 64, 8, and his worst meet was 63 feet. So, like, he was his consistency has gotten better. The, the big throw hasn't quite gotten there yet. He hasn't had that breakthrough 67-footer like we, we were hoping maybe by outdoors this year, but the consistency is better, and I think that's what athletes need to look at. There needs to be a reason behind your goal. You know, if your goal is 60 feet and you throw 52 feet every day in practice, it's not gonna happen. sorry, buddy, you're not throwing 60 feet. Right. It's reality. You know? <laughs> reality. You know, throw 55 feet first. I think it's funny because Nick, Nick Arrhenius was just uh, FaceTiming me when we are having this podcast. We should have brought him in for, for, uh, for, a throw, for an added throws discussion. But, yeah, I, I, think, I think that's, that's a – it's something that a lot of – a lot – I mean, I, I'm – I'm thinking about this with Rachel, just seeing her like to, to break 18 meters. She had to throw it in training a couple times, but she also had to throw like 57 to 58 consistently. And then that's what sucks is when she tore her Achilles, she's in training throwing 18 to 1870 every freaking toss, like boom, boom, boom. And you just knew something big was going to come. But that's where it's like, there's got to be – You've got to be realistic with where you're at as a thrower. And a lot of, I think a lot of young throwers, especially, they'll see, you know, what somebody's doing and they, they immediately are like, I want to do that. So I need to, I need to be there instead of looking at it as like a, just a, a step along the journey, like, you know, what Joe did, you know, since he's in college. And I think that's part of when you, you coach somebody, you, you see the throw. Sometimes you see it maybe in a footfall, you see it in a warm up throw, you see it in a practice. You're, usually you see that type of performance somewhere before you see it in competition. Right. And right. I've been surprised a few times. I probably coached, I don't know, 300, 400 people in my career, maybe a lot more than that. I don't know. But I've been surprised by a performance maybe two or three times. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, holy shit, where'd that come from? <laughs> from yeah. Like, yeah, really. I'm like, what the hell was that? And, and you're like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of the time it's like, I've been seeing that in training and, you know, no, you're getting, yeah. you're getting, you're knocking on the door, and yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And maybe it's a little better than that training throw, but that's usually we see it somewhere first before it, it comes out in a competition. Right. All right. So here, here's a question with with uh, it's sort of the the Barnes Krauser question. Um, well, I mean, if you can visualize like Barnes world record Krauser. Oh yeah. The I've Olympics. seen that thousands of times. Yeah. Which you know, what do you prefer? Which Barnes's world record throw, Krauser's technique, um, and I, I'm, I'm, I just want to lead this into who's going to break the world record, really, or who could, who could do it first? Well, yeah, I think um, it's taken a while to catch up to, to Barnes's <laughs> throw for whatever reasons. I think, you know, I think I know whatever it. era that was, there was enhancements, yeah. you know. Nothing against Barnes. I, I, I met the guy a few times. I don't know him really that well. But I, he got busted twice, so something was happening. and. <laughs> and it was, I think his technique was great. You know, yeah, yeah. I really like. I you know, 
I and think he had a mullet. He broke so the what, world record. His technique, yeah. his technique in the world record throw was was not, like good. Yeah, and I can picture that throw from the Sunkiss game. Yeah, games indoors. Uh, you know that overhead view of him throwing. Yeah, I probably watched that throw five thousand times. I know. You know, um, was he wearing like a was it a Mazda? A Mazda, one? yeah, Mazda TC shirt. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, and you know, I, I Black Spandex Stadium, the balloons. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Jim yeah. was throwing. You know, I got all. You know, I've I've seen that so many times. Yeah. Um, I think for Barnes, like he was so strong. It's similar maybe to like Dylan, where he was gonna throw far no matter what. But I really like. The, bit, the favorite thing I like about Barnes is his left arm in the middle. Like, he drops it, and it's almost like you get a high point like you see in discus throwers, and he's strong enough to get up and out of that. Yeah. Um, and I still kind of teach that a lot with my throwers where we try to drop a little bit into the middle if they can handle it. Um, so I really like that part of his throw. And I think the throw, like we talked about a little bit earlier, the throws evolve where the right side is a little more dominant out of the back with these throwers and they're relying more on physics and momentum. And that's what I like about Krauser. Cause we all think like, Hey, if I coach Krauser, I just tell him to go faster and he'll throw 80 feet. Right. Right. But that I'm sure Ryan has thought of that, you know, <laughs> he's pretty damn good. You know, he's tried no, lots he's, of different things. We're, we're the first, he's going to watch this podcast. And be, oh, maybe I should go a little faster. Yeah, if I get that right foot moving faster, I'll probably throw a lot further. <laughs> There's a reason why he does what he does, because him and his coach have decided this is the most effective way to do it. Right. Maybe he could throw further the other way, but maybe he fouls 95% of the time. Right. And, right. and so it's kind of like you hear about Jurgen Schultz. Well, he broke the world record, but it was with a reverse, but he threw no reverse because it was more consistent for him. Right. Um, but I, I would say I would like what I like what Krauser does on the back. And I really like what Barnes does into the middle. And they both are awesome up front. But Walsh is probably the best at chasing the ball out over oh, the toe board. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. So, you know, again, you kind of take bits and pieces of different people. And, you know, you kind of tell your athletes, these are the common things they all do well. So this is kind of how we want to build our style and within your own parameters. So who, who, who do you think has the potential to break the world record first? Could it be Joe? I, I think Darrell's twitchy enough that he could get close. Krauser, Walsh, you know, when you're – Darlin Romani, you, you're looking at it, you're like, who, yeah. could, who, who, could, who could be the guy? Who does it first, really? Um, I would – I suspect next time there's a major championship event, I think the world record might get broken two or three times. Yeah. I think it would be similar to, you know, back in Tokyo in 91 – when With the, long the world jump? record was broken in the long jump yeah. by both that by Carl Lewis and Mike Powell right. in the same competition, um, you know I think we might be in a situation like that where, um, you know, when you look at the measurements from that meet, there were millimeter differences. Right. You know, within the cent within the centimeter, yeah. they 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 published the exact marks and they were within millimeters of each other, which could be like someone holding a stick and they just oh, move it forward. Right. Yeah. It, yeah, so you know, how do you dis differentiate between those three, three guys? You know, I think Walsh, to me, when he's on, he's probably got the most potential. Um, but I think Joe, if he hits it, I, I don't know if anyone can catch him. Yeah, and Krauser's the most consistent out of the group. Dude, so, I'll, I'll say this: I I saw I saw Krauser in one session. One session he threw, he was like losing his mind in Doha, and then. The next day, it was like he was doing that session where he's like, where he's going as easy as he can over seventy feet, and then they were like, "All right, his dad was there. Okay, take take like six, a little harder, dude." He was I. There was there was a line at twenty. I swear he was throwing three and a half meters past this line, he was <laughs> smoking it. Now, uh, Joe and Darrell, I you know, same same track. Joe like Darrell was smacking him. Joe was just murdering shit, and it was like screaming, 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 and he was just killing it. And you're watching like, I, you just knew something crazy was going to happen. So it's, yeah. it's really interesting to see, especially now they've got another year. And I, you know, Joe's older; he's 30, 31. It might not be the best for him. Um, whereas Tom will be, I think, twenty nine or thirty when it goes down, and 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 Krauser's going to be a really good age. So I think. I think it's – I mean, Darrell's young. I think it's going to be yeah. 
and and I think Romani's like 27 or 28. So they're all at a pretty good age where it can go. Yeah, I, I think all three of them have a legit shot. And I said, I think Krauser's the most consistent. So that's something to look at. And I think, I think Joe, Joe's got to me the highest end, but Walsh hits it the hardest. Yeah. So it's, I can see all three of them getting in the meet and they're all throwing like 23, 20 or something <laughs> or more. You yeah. Know? It might just be, might be like go to jump to 77 feet. Oh, that'd be insane. That would yeah. be insane. But it's taken, you know, it's taken since, you know, what, how 30 years almost to, to get the record to where now we've got people that are challenging it that, you know, we assume they're all clean. I would, I would have no doubts that they all are. Right. Um, but, you know, that's when you have something that happens that's a, a, a freaky performance or whatever enhanced, like Bob Beeman's performance we just talked about, that took almost 30 years to 25 years wow. to, yeah. like, to the best that. And so I think combination of training and technology and all these things, you know, takes a while to catch up. I, I think, too, what's crazy is if you take somebody like Dylan, those freaks, I, as much as I dislike social media i think social media can actually ground somebody like dylan because they're they're constantly wanting to appease like the masses so they're constantly training and just doing crazy shit in the gym and they're pushing themselves all the time and they're more focused whereas when he came up none of that like none of that stuff really existed yeah he was chasing highs like partying or, or doing whatever and i think that that's what we're starting to see is a lot of these guys have come up with YouTube and with Instagram and, and, and Facebook and they're, they're, they have direct access to technology that that's showing them how to throw far and train well. Mm-hmm. And they're pushed all the time because, you know, they see what your guys, I, I always think about this with, with the collegiate throws on Instagram. It's like the UVA guys are seeing what the Nebraska guys are doing and the Nebraska guys are seeing what you know, Penn state's doing or whatever. And everybody's almost getting pushed by social media, which also makes it an interesting, you know, an interesting environment to, to, to train in really. Yeah. There's not, you know, and my, my old coach told me that a long time ago, there's, there's no secrets to success. It's, it's just a lot of hard work over, over a long period of time. Right. And if you do that and you've got talent, you're going to, you're going to be successful and, you know, and you can have the greatest coach or the worst coach, but there's a lot of room for, athletes now and coaches to to learn about the events whether they're going to throws university and taking a class or my website taking a class it doesn't matter it's the information is out there so i get really frustrated when i hear coaches that aren't willing to take the time to do that if they're watching this they're taking the time to do it if they're going to our clinics they're taking the time right, um, right. most of them but yeah. you know there's, there's coaches out there that they're still clueless and it just drives me crazy. And cause there's so much access to information right now, like, and access to people. Like I was going to buy Tom Walsh's bags. So I messaged his company cause the website was down. Tom Walsh emailed me back. Right. Right. It's, it's crazy. I'm like, Holy shit. Tom Walsh sent me a message. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, I'm like, I didn't say like, Hey, I'm a coach or this or that. I was just say, hey, thanks for the info. I'm like, I didn't want to be that guy, but I was just like, Tom Walsh sent me a message. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, so yeah. why don't you tell us tell us where where like where everybody can find you on Instagram and where they can find your website and all that stuff. Sure. Um, Instagram it's a Scott that dot capos. Um, you know, and I think my throwers run a page called the Corn Throwers. Um, I actually do have my own websites, digital track and field. And like I'm doing online coaching courses there. I'm in the process of building one now. I was telling Dane here before uh, we talked, they got about 75 lessons. I just got to figure out how to put them all in a course and organize them. I got to learn some technology here to 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 do some of these things. And because I want to give back, I I've been fortunate to have great coaches in my life. And anytime anyone messages me on Instagram or Facebook or wherever, I try my best to get back to them. Uh, quickly I tell people send me videos I'd be happy to look at them um, you know so so I want to be there to help help people as much as I can and uh, Dane you're doing a great job of that too you're a great uh, spokesperson for our sport yeah I appreciate that thanks so I will we'll finish this up and, and so head over to digital it's digital track and field dot com right? digital track and field dot com and like I said I'm in the process I've got some coaching videos up there now that are pretty I think reasonably priced in all the throwing events and 
and I'm always there to help if anyone need, needs anything else uh, besides videos. I've got articles on that website too. Um, I'll, I'm gonna, I posted a bunch of, I posted three articles actually today all about like body weight training and general circuits. So like if you don't have a place to train, you can look at the website and look at some programs I've written specifically for people that are kind of quarantined right now. Yeah, 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 for sure. Absolutely. And I mean, that's, that's so applicable right now. So that's good. And that, and this will right. be for, so people can, can, and we'll link all that stuff so people can get over there. So thanks for, thanks for being on the podcast. Coach Capos throws coach right. at the University of Nebraska. If you head over to digital track and field.com, you can pick up, um, well, hopefully soon you'll have your 75, 75, uh, your, your, your new coach. I got some lessons out there. I'm yeah. working on it. You better get to hopefully work. By, uh, hopefully by April 1st, I'll have it all up. <laughs> oh, jeez. No, the videos are up right now. You can okay, buy good. The, good. the lessons I'll have up in a few days. All right. Thanks. I got nothing else to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop the recording here. Thanks. All right. I'll talk to you later. See ya.